All right, thank you guys. Um, I'm going to get to the watching TV thing a, a little bit into the lecture, which is going to be fun, because this is actually connected to watching TV. Um, so yeah, so uh, yes, I just uh, thank you to B&H. Uh, thank you to David Brommer for uh, supporting me. This is, I think, my fourth time speaking here. Uh, thank you to uh, Deborah Gilbert as well for supporting uh, the relationship. And I'm really happy to be here. It's always a good, uh, good audience, a good place to present the work. So I'm really thankful to have a chance to be able to talk to you guys. Um, I am basically going to give you the same presentation that I showed at National Geographic that landed me the job with the job that I shot at the end of it. Um, and then talk to you a couple more things, you know, specific more to photographers rather than to editors at the end. I have been in the photo business for 20 years. Uh, I went to school at RIT in Rochester, 92 to 96. I had met an RIT alumni. Um, it was teaching photography to high school students at an art uh, center in North Carolina, which is where I went to high school. And uh, he inspired me to come and check out RIT. And I came to RIT, I went to RISD, I went to this other school called RISP, which was Rhode Island School of Photography. And I just, I remember approaching it so well. There was like a 12 foot high chain link fence with barbed wire around it. And the president greeted us at the building and he opened up my book and he was like, good, 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 you're in. And then, <laughs> so that scared me, that was done. Um, went to RISD and they were like, um, it was a gorgeous campus. I don't know if you guys have been there, but it's like beautiful place and everything. And you know, they set us down in the room. They're like, we can't guarantee you a job, but you're going to be a really good artist. And it was just like, off. It's like, I needed a place that was going to give me the training to learn how to work. And so I went to RIT, and it was a great experience. Um, it was extremely green. Um, I went to Rochester, New York, because it's in New York. I didn't realize that the New York that all the movies were about was seven hours <laughs> that way. <laughs> so. Um, but I had a good time in Rochester because I went from a town of like 50,000 people to a town of a million and it was still, it was the first time I was going to school for the thing that I was always doing after school. Um, so it did treat me well and I had a good time and everything. And then similar to like New York, I was still very green. I got here in 96 and I had heard so many horror stories about finding apartments in New York so I took the first one I found. I realized afterwards people meant a good apartment. <laughs> and then I was very determined afterwards. And my street sense got a little bit better and it was going on and everything. And uh, I started assisting right away. I interned briefly and then started working for celebrity shooters, for still life, for tabletop. Every single job that I could take because I was learning what I did and did not want to be doing, both subject matter wise and people and how they dealt with people. You know, the, the photographer that threw a bar stool at me, didn't, well, I didn't want to treat assistants like that. I learned that part. Um, the celebrity pressure, uh, didn't really want to be dealing with that either. I realized that that was uh, not going to work out well for me because the intensity of like, you've got five minutes was just a drain on me. And while I'm assisting for four years, I'm also shooting my own projects. Um, free magazines, tiny hair books, you know, pieces, whatever I can accumulate, you know, to get a tear sheet in a, in a magazine here and, you know, just slowly developing my aesthetic. and. Uh, one of those editors that I was working with got hired at a uh, pay and trade uh, magazine and they had just gone through a redesign and so they brought me in uh, to do their first cover shoot and that was like my first major like paying editorial job and that coupled with the contract with Getty Images got me out of assisting and I started shooting for uh, Getty for about eight years on and off with paid and unpaid uh, projects. So when I say unpaid, what it meant is that I would have to front the money on production, but then I would get paid better in the royalties on the back end. So in the long run, it was a much better deal, but I didn't know that at the beginning. So when they, when they first started giving me a shooting contract, um, I was getting less royalties, but I was getting a, a day rate on the job, plus they were paying for everything. So it got me opportunities to like rent a factory for two days and you know do a lot of other stuff that I wasn't going to be able to fund on my own, because at the time I didn't see how it was going to potentially uh, ben beneficial for me. So uh, I'm shooting stock in New York. I'm also starting to travel a little bit. I start dating. I'm dating this French girl. We go to, Aust uh, we go to uh, Niger in North Africa. She dumps me on Valentine's Day in North Africa. <laughs> um, <laughs> we come back. Um, I have a spare plane ticket. I go to visit a friend of mine from college who's in Vienna. Uh, I meet her best friend. I abduct her, marry her instead. Um, so we're bouncing back and forth to Europe, traveling. This is back when flying to Europe was like $300 round trip, by the way. This was like we were doing long distance, but it was a really, it was like, you know, it was like the cost of an Amtrak ticket to DC. It was kind of insane. So but we had a good time. And so since I had like the 
financial flexibility with the agencies where I could go shoot, turn the photographs over, and then get paid in royalties six months later, I was able to just kind of like get this like income stream going to let me keep shooting, keep developing, keep looking for projects. And at the same time, I'm still looking for gallery representation. Like I knew that at some point my goal was to get the photographs big and on the wall. And I didn't have a you know, like cohesive body of work yet, but I was looking to get the relationships. And then I started with ASMP in 2000. And in about 2005, I think I had the confidence to like say, hey, I want to set up a fine art portfolio review. And I got approval from the board to um, start researching it. And it took, about, it took me about two years to get a big enough list of curators and fine art connected people that would be interested to uh, do a portfolio review. And so I set that up as, as an event. And through that, I got my first representation with a gallery in Williamsburg. And this is some of the work that she showed. So um, yeah, this is one of the images with Getty. This was the installation of a new uh, windmill out on a farm. And that was actually our car, the little one. This just to give you a scale reference. So while this was going on, I'm starting to make you know some relationships and PDN had set up a portfolio review. It was like a one off like travel show, I think that they tested and then the, the program kind of died out. But during that, um, I met a book agent. And she was like, I think we should make a book of yours. And I was like, that's great. I've always wanted a book. But I felt that I didn't have a cool enough or a substantial like, body of work to like, make Stephen Mellon's cool coffee table book. So we came up with the idea to focus on the recycling industry. And that was connected back to the industrial landscape work that I was already shooting that I was interested in. And so it's like, we're going to do it on the 50 states, hired a writer, got a proposal together. I started sending it out, um, sent it to the scrapyard in New Jersey, told them that it's, you know, it's non-commercial work. I'm doing this for a book. It's going to be ready in about three years. This is 2007. Um, and they're like, yeah, they're sure. There's no problem. Come on down. And so while I was down there, there was a ship. And they're like, we can probably get you up onto that ship. And so this was a ship that's going to Turkey with scrap metal. And they were able to get me up onto the deck and uh, shoot it. So this is a uh, cement plant in California. I had gone out for our, my first art fair in 2009 at Photo LA. My gallery went out there. So I went, um, was showing at the gallery, but at the same time, I had my camera with me. And so I got access to the uh, cement reclamation plant. This is a electronics recycling. You know, I think all you guys are at the right stage where you can understand what the floppy disk is. <laughs> Some of the students don't know what that, that thing is there, that Maxwell. What is that? This was a bin of just computer uh, capacitors they had pulled out of like some machines. Um, this was a material. These are reconstructed truck tires. Um, I found out about this. There's a, they take these tires, stitch them together, and put them over areas that they dynamite, and to protect uh, like grass when they're driving heavy machinery over. And I just always loved the texture. It was like this very like serpentine quality of the old tires. And this is a, at a recycling plant on Shelter Island. Uh, it was just crushed glass. They just had, there was a mountain of this. This is a paper mill in Minneapolis. It's 97% post-consumer waste. So they're only introducing like another 3% of new wood into this. It's, it's for cardboard. There's just like this is streaming off cardboard boxes that they then sell it to the roll. And then they go off, get printed, and glued together and stuff. But just, I've always loved this image just because of the Russian elements of it, just the old like, industrial aspect. This is the same uh, paper mill. These are bales and bales of just like shreddings of coupons from grocery stores that they collect. And they had warehouses full of this stuff just waiting to go into these blenders. This is back to Shelter Island. This is the, uh, another image of the cans. I just, I'm always attracted to like textural areas. Um, just textural maps, and I've been kind of like accumulating these pictures piece by piece. And we had a show about this uh, titled Patterns of Interest at NYU uh, last year that featured this kind of work. It's a recycled dust saran wrap. Um, you know those big pallets of uh, materials that are at like Kmart and everything that come off of the trucks? So one of the ways that they keep all that stuff from falling down is that they use saran wrap. And the plastic apparently is very valuable. And each one of these bales at that time was worth about $6,000. So it's like takes a little while to get enough together to make a bale out of it, but it's like when you combine it, you know, there's twelve thousand sitting in your, you know, so start saving all that saran wrap. So as my career is developing and I'm making relationships, I'm going out to meet 
photo editors, art directors. I've been shooting people. I was shooting people for lifestyle. But I wasn't really in love with lifestyle. Like Getty represented me as a lifestyle photographer for a little bit. And there was another rep that wanted me as a lifestyle photographer. So I had like a lifestyle portfolio, and then I had my industrial landscape work. And I met an art buyer at McCann who looked at the work and loved the landscape work. And she just said to me, it's like, I can't take this book to Exxon until you have a guy with a wrench. Because they need the picture of the guy with the wrench. They need the human element in the scene as well. But they need, uh, you know, they need both done by the same photographer for you to land this kind of project. And I was opposed to it for about a year, because I was like, I don't want to contaminate the purity of my, you know, the landscape work. And then it was just like, no. It's like, why? I mean, <laughs> I'm shooting these people that I don't actually want to like, be you know, working with. And I wasn't like a great you know, lifestyle photographer. It's like, I was OK. But it's like, there's people that, like, that's what they do. They're really good at it. It's like, beautiful light, beautiful aesthetic. And that just wasn't where I was focused. So I was like, all right, so let me, let me you know, think about merging this. And so I dropped the, all the lifestyle books that I had and hired some actors and uh, went out and scouted some locations. And I found this location in New Jersey, these uh, flatbed uh, train cars for this city. And you know, he was perfect for it. I really still like this picture to this day. But one of the nice things that happened while I was shooting this is that I spotted this. So the MTA had an artificial reef project where they dumped over 2,000 subway cars in the Atlantic over the span of 10 years. And I had read about it right at the beginning of my recycling project where they were dropping the end of the Redbirds, which was the older iron trains in the 4, 5, 6, and 7 line. And I thought that the project was done. And so the security guard at the gate of the yard was like, you know, I asked him, like, what's that barge? And I was like, oh, that's the MTA's artificial reef project. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, can I get in to photograph it? And he's like, no. And I was like, well, can I, is there someone I can call to get in to photograph it? And so he got me in touch with the general manager for weeks. And then uh, Weeks got me to the MTA, and they both signed off on it because it's like this is a perfect fit for my recycling project. I've got this book that you know is going to be coming out, and they're like, "That sounds great." And so I ended up instead of just going into the yard to photograph the barge where it was parked, as I was able to get to the MTA itself where they were loading the trains, and then out onto the chase boat and photograph it when they were throwing the actual subway cars into the Atlantic. So, but I'll get back to that project in a little bit. My relationship with Weeks is, uh, is developing. Um, they call me. They're breaking up a ferry that I had sunk in Weehawken. It had sunk at an actual um, pier. And because it, was, it, just, it sank, it couldn't pump out the water. So what they did instead is um, they broke it up on site. And so they took one of their cranes out there, attached like this 20,000 pound guillotine blade, dropped it, and just broke it up into pieces. And then would go back with the bucket and kind of scoop out the debris. And so I photographed it for the day. And this is like the one key photograph that I have liked from that shoot. So after this, um, Jason, my contact there, uh, calls. And it's like, I don't know if you're interested, but tomorrow we're picking up this. <laughs> 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 so the Concorde had been moved off of the Intrepid to uh, when it was getting renovated for four years. And so it was parked down at. The first airport down in New York. Um, no, 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 no. Before that, down on Flatbush at the end of Flatbush, Floyd Bennett, Floyd Bennett Field. Excuse me. <laughs> Told you about getting distracted. Um, so they had to. Um, they picked it up from there and brought it back to New Jersey. But because of the tides and everything, they um, they have to wait uh, for the timing. So I rode with the Concorde back to the Intrepid, and uh, so that was one of the images at sunrise. Still one of my favorites. I just I love this shape, the bat wing. Got the Statue of Liberty, a little bit of motion blur from the water. So this is happening. All right, now January 15, 2009, uh, Sully makes an emergency landing in the Hudson River. All right, it's my wife's birthday. We are sitting in a bar watching TV <laughs> against David's uh, theory. And uh, somebody at the bar uh, had. I'm pretty sure it wasn't a voice in my head. I'm pretty sure it was someone down to the right. Um, I was like, I wonder how they're going to get the plane out. I was like, I know who's going to do this. <laughs> so I call Weeks, and they're like, we don't know if we have it yet, but I'm going to be in a meeting with the Coast Guard and the FBI tomorrow morning, so I'm not going to be able to pick up my phone. So call Tom Weeks. He always answers your, his phone. Just remind him 
you know, who you are, because we had met on some of these other projects, and I was like, hey, it's Steve Mellon, the photographer, and like, oh yeah, what's going on? I was like, did you get the job? And I was like, what job? I was like, the, the airplane in the, in the river. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, do you want, do you, do you want to wear it? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I get in my car, I drive out of my studio, we had a space at Union Square at the time, um, drive down to uh, Jersey, uh, I had plugged in into my brand new GPS, the office address, not the yard. And so I was doing this in New Jersey for a little while between the Garden State and the Turnpike for about 45 minutes. They're calling me, like, where are you? Because they were literally, there was a crane and a tugboat waiting for me. But um, they, I got on, they waited for me, I got on, and so I arrived into the crash site uh, via the water because I knew that if I tried to tell the NYPD or something that I was a photographer for weeks, they were like, whatever. Um, they weren't going to let me by. So I arrived uh, on the on the crane, on the smaller crane that they brought, um, and just walked into the site with my hard hat on and a life jacket and started photographing at the permission of Weeks. And they just saw me as one of the guys. So everyone was you know, totally fine about it. FBA's down there, um, NTSB. Uh, these are Airbus engineers um, talking to Jason in this photograph. Um, they had just landed um, from France and by chance at the gift store. There was an Airbus 320 with the US Airways markings on it. <laughs> so they bought it at the toy store, and they were just like holding it up to Jason, explaining where the center of gravity is on the aircraft. So, uh, so this is one of the first photographs that I shot when I was coming in uh, via the tugboat. I just always like this image. It's titled Whale, and I just always see it as like the wounded animal. You know, it's like the ladder's there, and there's the blowhole, and you can kind of like walk down. It's like, it's going to be OK. So about a day and a half later, um, comes out of the water. Um, pretty intense. There's an entire wall of like water cannons on the left-hand side, just in case it exploded, because um, it was pretty fuel of uh, pretty full of uh, jet fuel when it crashed. Um, fortunately, the blast point is pretty low at that point because of the fact that it's been underwater and it was a very, very cold weekend. I used to be able to say it was the coldest weekend in 30 years in New York, but the past two you know, winters have kind of screwed up that story. It was just a very cold weekend. So uh, fortunately, you know, and the great thing about this uh, emergency ditch in the water is that everybody survived. Um, and that was why I was comfortable photographing it. I don't feel comfortable shooting people's uh, disparity. You know, it's just like, don't do war, don't any, generally don't do any kind of uh, work like that. So. So I brought this to a portfolio review that I had helped organize. Um, one of the dealers um, saw it. Actually, two, two different galleries offered me solo shows after they saw this. And they took the larger of the two, which I'm really happy about, because I'm still with them to this day. The other gallery closed, so made the right call. But these photographs uh, picked up national press, um, national exhibitions. It's been a traveling show in a number of different places. Um, it did hit a little bit of a uh, trick when uh, NTSB, when the photographs first went live, NTSB freaked out a little bit because they hadn't been cleared by them and they hadn't released their uh, official report yet. So I had to take it down for a couple of weeks. Then it went back up. Then AIG's insurance went after me. AIG was the insurance agent for US Airways. And they claimed that because I was a sub, 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 sub contractor of theirs, I had to abide by their media agreement, and I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to take it down. But what I did is I put a post up on my website that just said these photographs are down uh, at the request of AIG and US Airways. If you would like to speak to them, here's their phone number. <laughs> and I put the phone number and the email, and it went from no, nobody, you can never show them ever, to Mr. Mellon, how can we help you? <laughs> so came to terms. Um, there now it was released. It just the only thing that they requested is that they asked me to uh, retouch out the logo if it was um, visible anywhere in its entirety in the photograph. And there's like one picture in the entire body work, maybe two, where we took it out. But it didn't bother me from that standpoint because that wasn't my purpose of it. And since then, U.S. Airways, the brand itself is now gone. Like the airline has collapsed. So I don't. I think it probably can even like put it back, and it won't be an issue. But. <coughs> uh, and this is one of the divers. I just I love that like that cement slash sticky putter thing that's in there that's like sealing 
and it's just the whole like 30,000 leagues under the sea. They uh, have these wetsuits on and then overalls, and they're just using like a steam cleaner for the sidewalk to heat, and so they're pumping water uh, as an insulation between the two of them, and that's the diver just coming out. It's just like dripping out water and encased in steam. This is the dive master. And one of the things I just love about this picture, on, on top of the Vulcan thing in the background, but it's just a couple of people have never seen him so happy. <laughs> and there's the inside of the aircraft. Um, yes, the hangar's still on. It's like the hotels. You can't actually take them off. Um, and I also, I just like the Jesus light in the background because the emergency uh, doors have opened and also the wings are gone. There was this like cascade of light into the inside of the aircraft. Um, we've met a number of the passengers. They had a solo show of this work in 2009. And so a number of the passengers came. Um, and at first we were really nervous, but they were really thankful that there's such a like, beautiful documentary of the experience that they had. And so like we met uh, one of the passengers that was in business class, and she was like, yeah, it was a little bumpy, versus the people that were at like in 39C, they were like, it's like hitting a wall of cement. Um, <laughs> interesting thing. Um, <laughs> um, they did not tell the passengers that they were landing in the Hudson River, so the people in the aisle did not know until they uh, hit the water. Yeah, I mean, just so you didn't panic, you know, don't freak out, but. Um, well, the aisle seats, you can't see. You know, the people are all glued to the windows that are looking at it, but, but the people in the middle aisle didn't know until the last minute. So, but Sully did a phenomenal job. The plane did a phenomenal job. We got really lucky. Um, the river did a pretty good job. Um, the aircraft is designed to hit water at, I think, 90 miles an hour. It hit at 150. Um, came down, one engine snapped off immediately. The plane spun around 90 degrees. Um, but structurally stayed intact and was able to float. The water is coming in, it's very cold, the wings were freezing over really quickly. Um, but it still, it, was, it really was an a amazing series of events, a miracle that everybody did survive this. Uh, this is some of the high-tech technology that Weeks uses to <laughs> move certain things. So they, uh, they transported after this and they missed judged one bridge height. So a journey that went 45 minutes became seven hours through downtown uh, Jersey, Jersey City and everything. And so there was these moments where you're passing these you know, very typical uh, moments of life. And there was, uh, this is titled 30,000 Gallons. Um, <laughs> there was a spot where like a woman came out on her porch and she's like, what's going on? I was like, oh, they're, you know, they're pulling the uh, plane down the, the road. And she's like, shut up. And then she looks down like, oh my god. <laughs> so, so getting back, um, so we take this work down to Miami. Uh, my gallery is at one of the satellite art fairs. The Flight 1549 images do pretty well, uh, along with the solo show. And they're like, you know, if you flush out that subway car project, we might be able to give you another solo show. And so I go back to Weeks, and uh, I was like, you guys still doing this? And I was like, yeah, we're still doing it. We've got a couple more drops. And so I go out with them again and kind of fill out that body of work. Um, this has now been featured in numerous exhibitions and almost every print place and manageable and online. It's had just an amazing, I refer to these photographs as being self-aware because they, they start promoting themselves more than I can imagine. Um, my website was averaging, like it was about 50 to 60,000 uh, hits for the year. And it, when I, I haven't looked in a few months, but it had gone up to about 1.7 million. So, yeah, and this is one of the iconic shots. So one of the things that I always love about this image is just like the sense of vertigo, because you can see the highlight inside that pole that you've been on. So you start feeling yourself kind of like, <laughs> So this is uh, off of the edge of uh, the crane, and they've removed the, uh, the front end of the subway cars. I don't know if you guys remember that series of cars that had that like plexiglass slope that was supposed to be aerodynamic, but ended up being totally useless. Um, this is what they rip off, and that's what they look like. They spend the MTA spends about a month uh, clearing the the barge, the entire like load. They take out the freon, the motors, the windows, the doors, everything that can break off. Um, signed off by the EPA. It's paid for by the tourism boards of the different cities. They 
originally only had to pay like shipping and handling. Like they, they literally were given a barge of subway cars as long as you pay shipping and handling, which is like you know fifty, sixty thousand dollars. But still, um, it got popular enough. It was a really successful program. So there's artificial reefs all along the eastern seaboard, both the subway cars and other materials. And this is. Uh, it's titled Settling, but we've nicknamed it Ghost Train. It just kind of looks like the subway car. It's just like chugging along on its own. That was the day that everybody lost their breakfast. And this is titled Pool. This love the acquiescent. The subway cars typically would like go like this. They'd like splash on the, the window side and then pop up. So that was why you've got like these water droplets coming down, and then the water starts going in. They sink relatively quickly. And they're always uh, bottom heavy just because of the way that they're designed. So they usually go straight down like that. Yep. So um, Weeks gives me a call um, after this, and we're still in touch. And they're like, hey, don't know if you're interested, but um, we're moving a chimney. And so I went out, and I photographed the, uh, the chimney. and. Uh, this is one of the landscape shots. One of the things that had uh, started to happen is that the 5D Mark II had hit the market. And um, that was like really the first like prosumer full frame video body that was shooting HD video. And I had started getting a couple of questions like, do you shoot video? And I was just like, no. Um, but then I was like, maybe. <laughs> Um, I was really resistant to the idea of the 5D Mark II. I didn't like the, the build of it. I didn't think it was a very effective like, camera. I didn't want to spend any money on it. But my compromise was to do time lapse. So what we did is I borrowed a bunch of uh, intervalometers from friends. So it would shoot the camera at a certain speed. And so we did a time lapse video of the chimney delivery. And it was OK. I didn't finish it very well. We didn't go back and finish. Like we did that, we followed it all the way to being delivered. But I should have gone back to watch it actually getting installed, which I didn't do. So the ending of the film kind of never like got to the next level and in, in, uh, stuff. But I did do another film, which should be.
So um, that video was created um, with all still cameras. We set them with intervalometers, shooting a picture about one every five seconds uh, for the most part. There was one shot where you see the bridge kind of sinking, which was a little bit uh, slower because it was going to take so long. And then in post, we would just sometimes speed up uh, the cut. And uh, we dumped like 90% of the footage out of this, like out of the 30,000 frames. Like I said, it's down to a four minute video. So it's a lot of that footage either got dumped or sped up. Um, I believe a lot, especially in video, like shoot first, edit later. Um, the video uh, did really well, um, got picked up by the Wall Street Journal, it got picked up by the Sci-Fi Network. Um, <laughs> they, like, they featured it on one of their blogs, it was like, you got to look at this, and like Wired and everybody. So um, at one point, I get a phone call, and it's from the Department of Transportation. And they're like, hi, um, that's our bridge. And why does your video look better than the one that I paid for? <laughs> <laughs> So went in, had a meeting uh, with the director of communications. We bid on the project. I ended up winning the contract. We've been, I've now been shooting stills and video for the Department of Transportation for the past four years as a government contractor. And uh, it's been a great relationship. Um, and this is one of the first jobs um, that we did with them. This was the uh, marathon. Uh, this was shot from uh, Staten Island. Um, we hadn't gotten all of the clearance that we, we didn't realize how much of a machine uh, New York Runners was. And so we hadn't gone through the whole press clearance and everything. So we didn't have the correct passes. So we got up to a certain point and then we had to retreat. But because we were in DOT vests, fire department, NYPD had a separate um, pit for their guys. And they let us in and we were able to shoot this image from there. And I think that turned out really nicely because it's just it's such a unique view of the, of the marathon. This is the, the curing some of the bike lanes at uh, Grand Army Plaza. And this was when we were scouting a project on the Manhattan Bridge. They replaced all of the suspension cables a couple of years ago. Um, one by one, they would they would like leapfrog it. They would take one down here and then reattach and then do this like in a, in a four section process and also reattach like they they put around like a Kevlar. Um, coating around the uh, support beam. And it's like a process they have to do every 50 years. And they hadn't done it. And we were hoping to shoot video and do a whole time lapse and follow this whole project. It got killed by the uh, bridges department. But um, this was one of my scouting photographs. I, just, I was so happy to be up there because it's, it's an intense view. Yeah. And then we did a uh, time lapse video, uh, time lapse and video at the sign shop in Queens where they print all of the, the signs. And so that, vil that film has also done really well. And it was a really interesting experience. Because every, every, a lot of people think that we outsource a lot of this work. And actually, a lot of it is still done inside of New York. It's a very traditional like silk screen process, where they're just these are all the screens stacked up on top of each other. And they're just printing them one by one. Um, this was from Sandy. Um, this was out in uh, uh, Long Island. Um, just some of the debris that had come out of the house. Um, they had hired us to document the cleanup efforts, and we shot a video and stills for the DOT. Where <coughs> one of the guys working. So that's the parking lot at, uh, I believe, uh, Howard's Beach. It's one, of the, it's one of those super long parking lots, you know, at the public beaches, but it was just they used it as a temporary landfill. And so they were dumping all of this stuff there. And then they loaded that into trucks that would then either get onto trains or be driven down to a landfill in Virginia. And this was another bridge project. Just the guy in the white suit. It's like his job was oiling the bridge. Um, this is another uh, still from the, one of the time lapse films. We did a film following the asphalt uh, department. Uh, that we titled Mill and Pave. It ended up taking two years because it got broken up between contracts and uh, Sandy. But uh, it worked out to be a really nice uh, piece of work because we followed both from the asphalt plant down at Gowanus to the actual milling and paving up in Harlem. And uh, just it turned out to be a really beautiful film. So uh, I did also have the opportunity to get out to an oil rig via Fortune magazine uh, in Brazil. Uh, they flew me out in a rider by a helicopter out to this oil rig. And we were getting a walking tour, and I was shooting scouting photographs, just kind of like mapping out what I was going to be shooting for the second half of the day. Lunchtime came, and there was a storm coming. And they're like, you have to leave right now. 
because um, we weren't going to be able to stay. So a helicopter came back early. So I fortunately had enough for the story, but it was a little bit shorter than I hoped. But this is at the refinery back on land, which is like the Star Wars Death Star as element of this. Refineries, refineries. So you can get a kind of a sense of scale because if you see the semi down there in the person. So after um, the subway cars got uh, picked up by the New York Times, I called uh, my contact at the MTA just letting him know. and. He was like, I don't know if you're interested, but they're sinking a destroyer in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> and so he got me in touch with the people that were doing the salvage operation. And I told him, like, you know, uh, Mike sent me down. He was like, oh, we love Mike, you know, whatever you need. And it's like, we own the ship now. We've got the tugboats. We'll take you out with us. And so they put me on a tugboat, and I so went, out, went out with them. So I ended up on a sinking ship um, with them. I wasn't the only person. but. Um, this is one of the photographs of one of the welders uh, cutting holes in the side of the ship. They had to do some of this on site because it had to be seaworthy to get towed back out um, to the site off of the coast of Delaware. Um, and this picture was a lot of fun because if you imagine a ship that's doing this and you've got smoke, and so trying to get the sunbeam lined up with the sparks at the right moment without you know, suffocating in this room. Um, but it did work. This is some of the scrap metal. So the, the military, some of the uh, ways that they operate is that they, they have to sell the materials back. They can't, it can't be for free. But it's extremely uh, low price, and it's based on uh, how people are going to dispose of the materials afterwards. Like They bought this, um, I think they paid a million dollars for it between the reef and the salvage company. Like they like. They secured the deal to get like the entire ship for a million dollars. And the, the way that they worked it is that the salvage company is going to make all the money back by selling the scrap that they pull off of the ship. Because like the, the chain that's there, every single link is about two tons. So it's like, um, actually, no, I'm sorry. They, I, the whole chain, I think, is two tons, actually. That's the other, there was another ship that's got a bigger chain. But the doors are also very valuable, and the propeller is all copper. So it's like 45,000 pounds worth of copper. <laughs> Do you know how much it weighs? I don't remember. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was exactly. So this is on the ship now. They're starting to put the hoses into the into the ship to start pumping the water down. Um, those are the fuel tanks. This is a hangar uh, bay for a helicopter. And they've already filled this with cement. And they're putting the hose down to start pumping the water. And I set up my camera. I'm really happy. This is awesome. This is gorgeous. This is perfect. Can't wait for the water. And then they moved the hose, and it wasn't as cool anymore. And, started, and I was thinking about it until I grabbed the hose. But I was like, eh. Because um, I was hoping to get the water splurring out of this. But it just it didn't end up working out. But I still I think the shot worked out pretty well. Um, this is inside the pilot house. This is where they've cut away all of the previous components, and they're just all labeled in there. And I, you know, no one's really understood exactly what those markings are. The theory is that it's just it's the <coughs> military and the scrap company just like marking off where which component was from what, as they're like referencing. Because a lot of this stuff was is still being used on other ships, so they kept like pieces of it and put it into storage for when the next time they need to replace it. Um, this was a nice pickup from the project. This was a dry dock right next to where they were prepping the ship in the Philadelphia Navy Yard. And I asked the people that owned it if it was OK to photograph. And they're like, yeah, sure, it's no problem. Um, just looks like a Roman archaeological dig site. And I've just always wondered like, whose office that is, where that ladder. <laughs> I also like sparks. Big fan of sparks. There she goes. So, bye bye, Radford. Um, that did, fortunately, uh, bring me to Smithsonian. Um, I had gone down to DC about four and a half years ago with my uh, previous agent and presented work uh, both to Nagio and Smithsonian and a couple of other places. And so about a year later, Smithsonian uh, hired me to go photograph the new class of destroyers that was replacing the one that I sank. Um, and so this was inside of a shipyard in Maine where they're building it. And it's the uh, Zumwalt, which has now been picking up some press because it's this new like high-tech destroyer and it's stealthy and half submarine. 
because actually it will it, it, it's designed to sink. They'll, they'll pump it full of water to lower the uh, horizon lines. So it's harder to detect. And then they'll pump the water back out when it needs speed. In the ballast. You seem to know a couple things about ships. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so this is the zoom world. So they're welding. They're welding these. Uh, these are just points that they're welding for the other sh uh, steel, I think, to get attached on the other side of the ship. Um, one of the other things that I love is being high. And by that, I mean in a lift. Um, so I got them to sign off and get me a 60-foot lift to uh, put me up. This was actually a 100-foot lift, but they would only take me up 60 feet. But it was still high enough for the ship, and I was able to like kind of get them to position exactly my crop and my frame. And it was just a matter of kind of like staying in one spot and just waiting for the right exposure and him and the sparks and everything. But it was it was worth it. And this is a, just a detail from it. Like they're, they're starting to put on the, the stealthy plates on the side and everything. These are just all these like welding marks. And the title of this is Do Not Burn, because that's what they wrote on the side of it. <laughs> so I did also get the chance to uh, photograph and film the uh, space shuttle. Um, that was another week's project. Um, when the Intrepid acquired the Enterprise, um, I got both weeks and one magazine to commission a documentary on it. And so we shot it. We uh, did a time lapse and video piece on it. And then Time Magazine ran a whole uh, piece on the delivery in LA. And so my client pulled it off of running it. But we still ended up with some awesome photographs from the project. So it's still, it's like kind of like sitting on the shelf. It's never been exhibited. The, the magazine never ran it. The museum uh, wanted it, but didn't want to pay for it. So we didn't give it to them. So it's just waiting for a home at the moment. It is going to uh, go into a book for next year, uh, which I'll talk about towards the end. But uh, it was a fun project. It's from the back of the tugboat. It had just hit the edge of the bridge. It's not a happy sound. Uh, I did one more video uh, for the New York Times. And uh, there was a couple of hiccups. And at the end, my editor said, we owe you one. And I was like, really? <laughs> because the one thing that I hadn't been able to uh, do yet for the magazine was to actually get into print. Because being based on being a photographer, I still have the obses you know, obsession about getting into the actual <laughs> magazine that's just onto the site. And we had wanted to do a story on the uh, Maersk, which was at the time the largest container ship that had been built. It was 14,000 containers. but. We had missed it, and Discovery Channel had run an entire thing on the biggest, you know, biggest blah, blah, blah. And so I started Googling again for the biggest first whatever, and I, came, I found the biggest ship. And I found out about the Prelude, which is the largest floating structure ever built by man. It's a liquefied natural gas plant that is actually a giant, giant half ship, half barge um, that is going to be docked off of the coast of Australia for 25 years. And before it has to get like refurbished, like they're probably going to put it back into service another ten years after that comes back into the shipyard. Um, reached out to Shell, who owns it, and spent about six to nine months between conference calls, timing, to get everything signed off between the shipyard, Shell, magazine. Um, but we finally got the go ahead from everything that there was about to do this move of these modules. And it was the first module about to be installed. And so they said, this will be a good time to come and shoot it. And so uh, the magazine sent me to South Korea in the summer of 2014 for a week to shoot this project. Um, just a little bit of scale. The prelude is 1,600 feet in length. So if you imagine that the, the World Trade Center tower is 1776, so if you cut off the antenna, basically, that's how big the ship would be if you put it up on its end. So this was one of the side views of the, uh, of the modules under construction. Um, they're basically giant Lego slash IKEA sets. It's just this entire module uh, process. Um, like I said, like, I like being high. Um, I was able to get up on top of one of the cranes. Um, and so we shot a time lapse-esque overview of the top of the ship. And we got uh, the crane driver to move the crane down the uh, pier. It's on train tracks. And so it just moved along incredibly steadily. It's like the most steady tracking shot imaginable. And then the New York Times assembled that into kind of like an interactive map online that you can fly over. Um, and this is one of the stills from that. And I just I love the perspective of it, because you're looking down the side of like a 10-story high building with the workers and the edge of the crane. It's just the, the play of dimension and the scale is 
tricky. This is inside one of the cooling tanks. Um, the gas that comes up, what they do is they, um, they chill it because it gets a lot denser to transport. So they bring in the natural gas and bring it into these giant uh, cooling chambers. And so this is one that was under construction, all the scaffolding and the safety nets and stuff. And, and so that's the side of the, uh, of the prelude. And again, if you can see the people that, you know, that one guy that's like standing there, it gives you a little bit of sense of the scale of the, of the ship. There's what I mean about the Lego slash IKEA element of it. You know, it's just like they lay out all the tools and the components, and then they just start building it layer by layer, and then attach a layer on top of the next layer. And then once all the layers are assembled, they pick up the entire module with a separate crane and put it out onto the onto the top of the prelude. Yeah, there's one of the one of the layers. There's the first module. So if you kind of get a sense of like where the scaffolding is, if you figure that that's like high enough, like you know it's this eight foot clearance for a safety, so every single one of those layers has got eight feet. So you're kind of looking at basically like a ten story building right there, just being picked up. Um, that shot was actually from a remote camera. I had set up a camera because I couldn't be in both places at once because they had locked down. Um, you couldn't get on and off the ship for safety reasons, so I had to choose between being on a boat in the water or being up on top of the deck. And so the way I fixed that is, is that I got a camera, super clamped it to the rail, put the intervalometer there just to take a photograph every, you know, like 10 seconds and let it, let it roll. And then I went down onto the boat and shot this because I felt that this was going to be the icon like this was going to be the hero shot that they needed. They ended up running it in the magazine, the, the stuff that we did from the rails, as kind of like a stitched together panoramic. But, oh. so, um, so I bring this, uh, I call up uh, National Geographic. I emailed one of the photo editors that I met, and she referred me back to another photo editor who was somebody I had worked with at The New Yorker and I had met with while she was still at The New Yorker. And now at National Geographic, I emailed her and was like, hey, Whitney, do you need any bagels? <laughs> and she said, yes! <laughs> so I um, was able to set up an appointment with National Geographic, um, went back down, and um, it was just, it was a really wonderful experience. It was about 20 photo editors in the room, and I went through basically all that stuff that you just saw. And uh, they, I think, really got my obsession a lot better, because four years I had it, but not anywhere as much. And now with all these other projects and the other assignments, and with, you know, with New York Times as being one of the clients, they um, had hit like a new level in my career from where I was four years before. And while I was showing the work, uh, one of the photo editors in the room asked if I knew about this ship, about the SS United States. And I was like, I've seen it, I've driven past it, I've never shot it. And he was like, I think one of our writers was on it when he was a kid. And so we went back and I met him and he was like, yeah, I traveled that ship when I was like eight years old with my parents. We went back and forth from Europe a number of times. And a friend of mine in New York, a former photo editor uh, from the New York Times, Stella Kramer, um, had introduced me to her brother a while back, and she had mentioned it that he was like in relationships with the conservatory because there's this whole conservatory trying to keep the ship out of the scrapyard and as a, like a national uh, monument that holds a speed record, and um, they just didn't want it to turn into scrap metal. And so um, David got an email chain immediately. We had a conference call right away with the executive director of the of the ship with the writer and uh, she was great susan was wonderful and she was like we've got like a lot of big news can't talk about it um but we couldn't shoot right away because of people's travel schedules and so we pushed this back to january but the timing worked out really well because like they had a press conference i think like january 15th that one of the cruise lines had bought had agreed to take the ship and put it back into service. They're going to have to gut it, refurbish it, and everything. But they've agreed that they're now actually going to start uh, using it as a uh, cruise ship again. Um, so, two days later, National Geographic was able to launch my photo essay that I shot on this ship, and I spent three days um, shooting it. So this is in the, in the inside. It's a fake bar. That was a bar that was from a movie set that someone else had shot in there, and they just left the bar there, and so it's still there. Another ballroom. 
all the ballrooms are like separated by classes. I've never been on a cruise ship, but there's only like first class. There's the first class bar, second class bar. It's like it's kind of classy ish. <laughs> And so I also, uh, at the suggestion of my wife, this even, wasn't even my idea, but she, I told her the one thing that was going to be possibly missing was these aerial shots. And I looked through, because a lot of other people have photographed the ship, and one thing that was missing was this, this vantage point of being from the outside of the ship but not looking like this. And so I emailed my editor, and I got them to get me a lift. So we were able to rent that 60-foot lift that I like having and had it on the pier and was able to move it around and shoot the exteriors of the ship as I wanted. This is one of the viewing decks. Because it was a transatlantic uh, ship, it was all enclosed. There wasn't anything because it was freezing you know, when you're crossing the ocean. So the hatches, and the ballroom. This is the only moment I felt scared in this ship, um, only because of the fact that this is very reminiscent of like a horror film for me. It's like, hey, here's this giant dark pool with no water in it. Let's go down and see what happens. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the engine room. Um, this is decks and decks of uh, controls. And uh, we did a couple of photographs in there. We could have shot, I think, an entire week just in the engine room, because it's like five decks of all these different controls. You need a lot of lighting. There's no light on the ship. There's a tiny bit of power. They've got like one gas generator that's powering a couple of safety lights. But this is all my, my lighting. And there's the, that's the anchor room. So those uh, go straight out to the ocean. There's, a, there's an angle where you can actually see the water uh, down at the end. This was a nice uh, pickup shot. I was actually shooting the safe that was like 180 degrees um, around me. But we turned back, and there was the gorgeous light and the structure and everything. So we spun the light around for a minute and shot this. And just I love the watertight hatches and the, the doorway. A little obsessed about doors. I do like shooting doors. There's the bow. That's, yeah, like 30 to 40 feet up at sunset. And here's my last video. The way the, the Brooklyn Public Library, by the way, uh, came about was because uh, Rob, the former uh, director of communications at the DOT, uh, left the DOT, went to the Brooklyn Public Library, and I went with her. So we now maintain relationships at the DOT and the Brooklyn Public Library. And so that has been a, you know, just a really nice relationship. So, and I've noticed that with a couple of other you know, people. It's just like, as they move, I go with them and then stay at the original place, but continue on with them. It, all right, thank you very much. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.